doing well this morning. Everybody's in their appointed place. God has got a plan. He says he's got a plan for us, right? So Jeremiah 29, 11, God is working things out for us. So let me go into prayer. Father God, we thank you for bringing us here this morning. We thank you, Father, for our health. We thank you that our minds are in the right place this morning. We come here to receive from you this morning. We thank you that our hearts are soft towards you. We look forward to the word you're about to pour out unto your people, this household of faith. We thank you, Lord God, that there is order in this place. We thank you that everybody who walks through this door is healed from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. We do not fear any sickness, disease, virus, or anything otherwise, because you've already healed us in advance. Father God, we just give you glory, praise, and honor this morning. We thank you, and we say amen. The altar is open for worship. Come on, feel free to come forth. Who can stand until the heal of the Lord? Who can stay in his holy place? Only those with clean hands and pure hearts. So give us clean
worship you. Come on, you were created for worship. Yeah. Come on and sing. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. give God some praise in this house. Hallelujah. His praise that should be ever on our lips. Not just when we come into the sanctuary, but his praise that should ever be on our lips. Dolores and I just got back on late Wednesday night. We left Sunday. And as we were leaving, we turned on Joy Center, the program. We caught the program. But when we were coming back on Wednesday, I, I don't know what she was doing with the radio. I don't know what she was doing, but we could not get the Wednesday night service. The reason I'm saying that is because I do not like being disconnected from the body. It is such a joy to come back to be in the midst of God's people. Amen. And so I find it a thrill, a joy, an awesome delight to be in the midst of God's people. And so I come back and I see and there, there, there are new faces. I see uh, Peter here. And people, visitors can, can believe that we're visitors. He was asking me if I needed a, a first-time visitor card to fill out. Uh, no, 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 we go here, we go here, we go here. But it is a thrill to be in the house of the, the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. And we should take every opportunity to give God praise while we have an opportunity to do so. Amen. So turn to the person to your left and to your right and greet them and tell them that it is a joy to worship with them this morning. Amen. that person across the room. If not, I'll give you five seconds to run across the room and hug that person that you've always wanted to hug and embrace. Amen. <laughs> amen. You can wave if you like to. But we, amen. How you doing? Were you waving at me? Amen. I, I'll receive that. I'll receive a wave. Amen. Make sure some love is coming with that. Pushing it out there. Are you all blessed? I'm excited. I'm like giddy being in the presence of God's people again. And he, oh yes. And those that are watching by way of the internet, please, we encourage you all to stay tuned in all the way until the end. And we're encouraging you to come on out. Um, we just believe that God is bigger than coronavirus. Amen. We believe that God is still in the healing and the 
deliverance business. We're not denying the reality of coronavirus, but we know that we serve a, a powerful God, a, a mighty God, and a God that is able to deliver. And if God can take uh, uh, some blood, put it over a doorpost and say, death angel, you shall not go into this house. If God can do that way back then and they didn't have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them, you know that everything that is created in Satan's kingdom recognizes the, the seal of God on his people. And so when the death angel comes, when coronavirus goes out to destroy, he says, oh no, not her, not him. They are marked by God's precious seal, amen? And so I'm speaking prophetically against the fear that is trying to grip this nation. That Satan knows and recognizes all of God's people who have been marked and sealed by his son's blood. Amen. And so as we go out there and we live our lives, we say, Father, we thank you that we are covered. We thank you that we're not under the curse. Amen. So if you're living right, if you're not living right and you repent, you say, God, wash me with your blood. Deal with my sin. Because the enemy is running. He's running to find those who are not covered and those who are not sealed by his blood. And make sure that when he finds you, he finds you protected. Amen. Do we have those uh, video announcements? I, I hear they're amazing. My wife saw them and she says, I'm going to love this one. So if those video announcements are cute, go ahead and play them and I'll be up right afterwards. Um, yes, you may be, you can stand and watch them if you like, but you may all be What's seated. Up, Joy Center fam? Let me tell you, it is such a blessing that God woke us up today to bring us here this morning. And we're going to take full advantage by receiving all the blessings he has for us. So we have some announcements following. Thank you for joining us here at the Joy Center. We'll see you in a bit. Bible Land Learning Lab is a new and innovative approach specifically designed to provide academic facilitation for pre-K to middle school students. Our aim is to provide a safe, productive, and academically monitored environment with the goal of helping students meet expected state learning standards. We provide classroom facilitators, meals, and we also accept CCS. Limited space. Contact us today to learn how you can make an investment in your child that will last a lifetime. I know we have communion tonight. We don't have any product. They're all out everywhere. I've checked all over town. Don't worry about it. I know who to call. They'll take care of it. Thank you. Yes. By Wendy. Okay, we're on it. So? We have a job to do. How much time do we have? Today, by six. 
Better get going then. Wow, thank you, fast. But uh, what's with all the theatrics? Sir, we provide our services to churches all over the world, and we're highly trained to uphold a certain standard. Pastor, and with all due respect, we're not working for you. We're doing this as unto the Lord. Okay, that's all for the announcements. As always, Joyce and her fam, get ready and prepare your hearts to receive the message that God has for you. And to all of our first-time visitors, we would just like to extend a nice warm welcome to you. If you would like to stay up to date with what the Joyce Center is doing, feel free to follow us on our social media platforms. That's all we have for today. Until next time, God bless you. My wife had to re remind me that I had to go back up there. I enjoy the commercials so much. Amen. <laughs> I ain't lying. That's the reason I come to church, the commercials and cartoons. <laughs> it is good. Ain't it good? Amen. I think uh, it, they do an amazing job, and they are uh, going to be getting married soon. And hopefully, hopefully the dynamics of marriage don't interfere with the flow of what they bring to us on a Sunday morning. Amen. I want to remind everybody about the Roll Call Sunday. Please make sure that we're all out. And for those that are watching by way of online streaming, the different platforms, we want to make sure that you come out for this Roll Call Sunday. We want to have maximum attendance. And we are still going to be mindful of the, uh, the social distancing. And you all see that we've taken out many of the chairs uh, from the sanctuary so that we're creating the separation that uh, will make some of you all feel comfortable. But we want to make sure that on this Roll Call Sunday that we're having maximum uh, attendance. Amen. Are you all committed to coming out? Those of you who are in the sanctuary, how about you all at home? Are you all going to be here? 65% of the people nodded in agreement that they're going to be here as well. And so I just sense that in the spirit. I also want to um, uh, remind everyone, for those of you who have not taken the survey, you all know that we're going to be uh, opening up a federal credit union very soon. Evangelical Invest Investments Federal Credit Union. And I know that uh, my wife and I my, and my son, we took our survey m months ago. And so this is something where we need everyone's uh, assistance. And so it's a simple survey. It doesn't take long at all, but the surveys are what is needed for us to go forward. Because those who look at where we are and what we want to do are looking at how much participation from our own members we have. And so if we're not on board with it, they're going to say, uh, I, I don't know about that. So we need your support to take the survey. The survey is not binding you. You're not obligated by what you put on the survey. It is a survey to show their, our support to the venture that we are going to do. It's going to be a success. We're going to do this. We want to make sure that you're a part of it. Amen. Are you all on board? Are you all ready for the word? Amen. Amen. The word is about to go forward. The, the Bible says that it is God's word. The entrance of his word, what Moses says, the entrance of your word, it gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And I used to be simple, but I'm no longer simple. I've been seasoned by God's word. Amen. And so I come Wednesday. I come on a Sunday. I even come out on a Monday to pray. 
because I want God's word to sharpen me. If you all are ready for the word, stand to your feet. Let us put our hands together for the angel of this house, the bishop over this house, Bishop Dr. Michael Brown. Give him a round of applause, amen, as he comes and breaks down the word of God. Praise God. Thank you, man. I love you, brother. Jesus is Lord. Now, just in case you all don't know, some of you, the word angel does not mean that I am an angel in a sense other than the definition of the word, which is, it means messenger. So an angel is just a messenger. I am not the message. I'm just a messenger. And God has something for you today. I believe strongly. And uh, I'm ready for God to do something powerful. Glory to God. That means that uh, we got to get out of the way and let him get in the way and do everything that is necessary for us so that we can receive the word. Thank God we have, we have prayed for one particular person who is now in the audience, Angel. And uh, where is she? Is she still here? Praise the Lord. Glory to God. That's a miracle. And in case you don't know everything, we've talked about it. We've been praying and interceding for her. And uh, just to be able to see her in church today is incredible. That is God. I'm telling you one thing that I know for certain. If you want to see change, you got to believe in the one that can change all things. When you are incapable of changing your circumstances, you cannot heal yourself. You can't fix yourself. You got to let the fixer do everything. Trust him. And when you see miracle after miracle, when you see doctors that have given up on people, and uh, we're still praying for one brother that's in uh, North, uh, not North, but uh, Delaware, who ex ex is experiencing uh, coronavirus with other items or issues. And, uh, and so we're praying for him. We're praying for his, his health and uh, that God will restore him. Also, Elder Linden, many of you may not be aware of, this morning he had surgery. He would have had surgery yesterday had he not uh, drank a, a shake. But he had to have surgery today, an emergency surgery, because he has an infection in his back that happened as a result of the surgery that he had a few months ago. And so uh, when they saw that he had an infection, they said, we got to do surgery immediately. And so uh, we ha George took him to the hospital this morning. And uh, George, how is he doing? He hasn't called. Okay, we're still waiting on, on his response after he gets out. One of the things I wanted him to just know that we love him, it's easy to take workers for granted. Uh, he's a worker. Now, he may rub you a few the wrong way every now and again, but he's a worker. And uh, I, I, I just believe that uh, when you're praying for someone like we're praying for, for, for him and, and so many others, uh, you just sometimes you can hear all the negative, negative news and just, just think that, you know, there's no hope. But our hope is in Christ. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're trusting God, and uh, not, not yet, yeah, he deserves all the glory, and we want God to get all the glory that we know that he's worthy of, and uh, it, life is real, death is real, and when you see people you love, and even those you may not know, I don't know if it moves you to any gr to degree when you see the parents that are crying on, on the news because their little child was shot, uh, a little uh, old lady shot and killed, and you see uh, teenagers shot and killed that's in the midst of things, and your heart has to go out. Uh, this, this world is, is a cruel world, and, but it takes just a few people to start doing the right thing. Now, we can't change people, but you can change environments. That means that uh, you got to decide who you're going to be around or who's going to be around you. And if you want the right people around you, you got to hear, you got you to be able to put yourself or position yourself so that, so that you can hear the truth. 
because sometimes people don't realize that every time they open their mouth, they're, they're seeking somehow to inadvertently control you or influence you. And so we don't want that. We don't want a relationship built on manipulation. I want a real relationship built on friendship. I'm not trying to run your life. You're not trying to run my life. I stay out of things concerning your life until you invite me to come in and pray. Uh, and I think some things we have to come to, to the conclusion. If somebody shares something with you, keep it private. Uh, and I've encouraged so many people. The Bible says to share, uh, to share your faults with one another, not your sins. Don't tell everybody about your sins. That's between you and God. I said, that's between you and God. You tell somebody about your sins, they may not know how to deal with you after that. Right? That's why you don't tell people everything about you. You could say, just pray for me. Well, what should I pray for? Just pray for me, idiot. Just, just pray for me. I'm not saying this is an unspoken request. I'm saying pray for me. Just pray God to give you. If you really pray and you seek God, the Holy Spirit will give you what to pray for. And you don't know, you don't have a clue of what's going on. It's when people start trying to get involved in your life as if they want to give you all the, the advice. I'm not looking for advice. The prayers of the righteous avails much. Not the gossip, the prayers. So just pray. Pray for me, pray for my wife, pray for each other, pray for our children, pray for our children's children. For some of us, pray for our children's children's children. <laughs> I have two grand, great-grandchildren and, and, and I'm too young for two great-great-great-grandchildren, uh, but uh, that's all right. God just saw fit that I have them at this age. Uh, when you're 50 something years old, 51, 52, I didn't add on the other years. I'm, you know, at least I'm not 40 something. <laughs> but this is the day that the. And what are we going to do? Now, if you want a better understanding of God, I want you to pay attention to this message. Now, don't just hear what I'm saying. Jot down, take notes, take out your cell phone, don't text anybody unless you're texting them, tuning into this and sending them the link. After that, no constant conversation. Just hear, don't be distracted. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church because this is just the first of the series. I, I even started some things on Saturday, I mean Wednesday night, that should have just stirred you up. Was Wednesday a powerful way that God ministered to us? Yeah, let me tell you something. I got so much. I, I, I had no intentions on that. You can't even rehearse and practice that kind of service. It's, it's an intervention. God intervenes. And he changes things. And so uh, while you all were on the road, we were on our knees praying that you all get here on time. <laughs> no, no. But we love you. Are you blessed today? Get ready, put your two hands up and give somebody a high 10, glory to God. Give somebody and I a high 10. And you can have your wonderful seats. I want to make some things clear. First of all, God can never be understood by our finite ability in which to perceive or explain the meaning or the nature of the essence of God. You cannot explain nothing. Are you listening? God has to be believed and accepted on the basis of faith, not intellectually. So you cannot understand God by intellect. You got to understand God by faith. The origin of God is also to be believed and accepted on the basis of faith and not intellect. The origin of when I say the origin of God, not as though God has a beginning, but the origin of all things that God created. The word origin is the ability that something exists not derived from anything else. So God exists 
not deriving from anything. He always was. And if you're going to get a glimpse or an idea of God in how to communicate with the Father, you have to understand that you got to communicate with him from the basis of who you are inside of this body. This body is physical. This body is not spiritual. God is a spirit. And let me say it this way. It's literally God is spirit. God is spirit. Say that. God is. Say it again. So God is spirit, and the Bible says he that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, when you get to trying to understand God, it, it, again, it takes faith. Because the more people try to explain God, the more confused you become. It's like when someone is going through something that's tangible or physical, how do you explain that someone who is not physical can take care of it? So it's hard for people because people only can identify with that which the material that is your issue, only the material can fix it. But it takes an invisible and a non-existent God to take care of issues that we cannot take care of in and of ourselves. Now, maybe I'm losing you at the beginning, but I want to give you this. The Bible says in Genesis 1 and 1, how does it start? We started talking about it on Wednesday. How does Genesis 1 and 1 start? In the beginning, God. That's how it starts. In the beginning, God, which should be God created in the beginning. That is the proper Hebraic way that it should be written. But when it was translated over, because we read everything from right to left, in the Hebrew, everything is read from left to right. So if you really want to know how to understand the word, you really do have to go back to the, to the, to, to the, uh, uh, to the language for which it was written in. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and the New Testament was written in... Y'all can talk to me. Y'all can say Greek. The word God literally means in the Hebrew translated Elohim. Anytime you see E-L, it's always in reference to God. I don't care what name it is. It's like Israel. Israel is not just Israel, but E-L at the end reference God. Every time you see it translated over into the English, E-L is in reference to God. Whenever you see the name like Michael, the last two was E-L. That is in reference to God. That's why Michael means that God, God is not in Michael, but God is Michael. God is dealing with Michael. God, Michael is salvation or Jesus or uh, uh, Mashiach. We can go on and on and on and talk about E-L. But when we talk about Elohim, Elohim, L-O meaning L, God, and He meaning plurality. I am at the end of Elohim references plurality. It doesn't mean that that's God's name. God doesn't have a name like you think we think he has a name. He has a name, but it's not God. God is a title. So whenever somebody says, I believe in God, I got to ask, which God are you speaking of? Because there, there's a pluralities of gods that we created in our own sense. Our car can be our God. Our wife can be our God. Our children, our husband, our job, our sin. Anything that we place, is for, we place first in our lives is our God. But none of those things outside of God can do what God can do. God, who is first, say God is first. Remember this, if your life does not have God at the very top, that means you have really no relationship with him because God is not going to play second fiddle to anybody. He is never going to share the first spot with anybody, not with you and not with anyone else. God is first. God is first. 
So Elohim is God. The word bara, which is in the Hebrew, means create or fatten or build up. So God created Bereshit in the beginning. God created in the beginning. That's the first thing. Not in the beginning God, but God in the beginning created. God created what? Time. Before he created the heavens and the earth, God created time. Because if God's going to create the heavens and the earth, it can't start with the heavens and the earth. It's got to start with beginning. God had to create the beginning. That means that God created start. God created the beginning before the beginning began. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth, but he created beginning. Everything has to have a start. Everything has to have a start. Everything but God. All of God's creation had to be placed in the capsule of time because time would then regulate everything else. That means God is outside of time, doesn't it? So God is not affected by your emergencies. When you say, God, uh, 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 you know, if you don't come now, it's, I'm going to lose this. God will say, lose it because I ain't coming now. What does it matter to God when you say, God, come now or they'll kill me when he can resurrect you? They said, I'll lose my eyesight if you don't, if you don't intervene, God, God, God can restore the blind. God is not moved by time. He is the creator of time. Stop trying to put a hurry up on God when God doesn't move in reference to your situation like that. If we are trusting God, it doesn't matter when he comes because whenever he shows up, he's always right on time. Amen. Are you trusting him? Well, God says, somebody says, well, I'm about to be evicted out of my house. How many of you have gone through times and you thought that God didn't show up? Absolutely. But did you end up losing everything? Are you still alive? Did you get restored? Thank you. <laughs> it's just that you think that your situation deserves, it's an emergency, and unless God does something now, it's hopeless. God is not moved by circumstances. He creates them. So Genesis 1 and 1 is referring the whole scripture to Jesus as God, who is the word, the beginning of all things and the creation of time and the beginning and the start means that Jesus is the focal point of the entire scriptures and the creator of all things. When you go to John 1 and 1, I want you to see this. John 1 and 1, and I've said it so many times, comes long before Genesis 1 and 1. Yes. Genesis 1 and 1 refers to a creation. But John 1 and 1 says, in the beginning was, what? The Word. And the Word was God. And the Word, excuse me, and the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. And when you look at the third verse, it says, all things were made through him. The, the third verse. All things were made through him. Now, wait a minute. Who's, who, who is him? The word, okay? All things were made through him. This is why if you want to get through anything, learn the word. That means also, if you want to overcome circumstances, Learn which word to declare. Because most of the time, you don't even realize it's your words that got you into trouble, but it can be your words that can get you out of it. Are you listening to me? Everything begins with a word. The word 
was God, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, or the Word was in the beginning with God. So we see that God, through Him, which is the Word, everyone and everything and everything you can possibly imagine was made by the, through the Word, and without Him, not a thing was made that is made. So nobody makes anything first other than God. You can change what is made, but you can't make anything other than God making it first. You can only change what you are, but you can't change who you are. God already made you. Are you listening to me? And when he made you, he didn't make you where you could change the inside. He made you where you could change the outside. The outside is subject to change. Say that. The outside is subject to change. That means your body is subject to change. Nothing on the inside is subject to change. You don't get older. In fact, your spirit man never sleeps nor slumbers. Not in a physical sense. So Jesus is the incarnate, and the word incarnate means embodied or personified. Jesus is the embodied or personified word. And when you go down to John, the, four, the first chapter, the 14th verse, notice he says, and the word became flesh. Look at somebody and say, you are the word in flesh. When you go through a problem, I guarantee you, you don't even pay attention. Your problem is determined by words. Isn't it? I can't say I have a problem and it doesn't have a name. All things are subject by the word. The word is how we identify things. When you say, I have an issue with something, it has, it's, a, it's, it's not just a name out there with nothing like a symbol. It's a word. If I have cancer, I call it cancer. If we're going through a divorce, we're going through a divorce. We're calling it something because it's identified by a name. When I deal with poverty, I'm saying poverty, it's a name. All things that has a name that's created by the word because if the word created it, he created it with a name. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everything will confess. Cancer will confess in the end. My prayer is that we get cancer to confess before the end that we determine that we are healed according to his word. I said according to his word. And so the scripture is clear that the, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When you jump down to the 14th verse, if you can go down to the 14th verse of 1 John, it says, no one has seen God at any time. Right? 1 in 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only, excuse me, at any time, the, the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father has declared him. Now, no one has ever seen God. Have you seen God? Okay, nobody has seen God. You, have you all seen God? You all didn't answer. Have you seen God? So you've never seen God. Only one person has seen God. That's the one who was with God in the beginning, before the beginning began. Whenever you deal with the word God was, that means that he always is. There is no such thing as was with God. <laughs> but there is a was with you. But there is no was with God. Where was the word? The word, which is the son, was in the bosom of the father. 
Where is the bosom? Uh, can I ask you? Do you know? You should know. We call, and we, 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 we so kindly say the bosom of a woman, the breast, the chest area. So the bosom is the breast or chest area of the body. Why is the son in the bosom of the father, the chest area? Because it is poetically considered to be the place of our feelings reside, where it reside and the breath potentially flows from out, from our chest, the air. So the bosom area is key. Have you ever felt a gasp in you and it was in this area? The son, the word, is in the bosom of the father, meaning just as 2 Timothy 3 and 16 says in the NIV, it says all scripture is what? God breathed. And God said. You cannot say without air, oxygen. Are you all listening to me? In other words, words are spoken that are fluttered or flattered or flatting. It deals with an air coming up, even as I'm talking now. Air is coming out and or wind and wind is considered spirit. Jesus said the words I speak are spirit. In other words, and life, they are coming up from my bosom. When we sing, we sing from our diaphragm. As in the, to hit that certain note, you know. And it comes up, our vocal cords begin to flap. Words is what you hear. And those words are not physical. You cannot take my word and grab it with your hand. We cannot take the word of God and grab it with our hand. And yet the Bible says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among him and we beheld we touched we touched God they didn't even realize in that day when they were touching Jesus they were touching God God became a living essence in the body of Jesus the word became flesh Years ago, I started dealing with this because I was going through some physical problems and I, I started hearing the word and learning the word and I wanted to know, God, well, if, if you said this, how come certain things aren't happening? Have you ever just read something and you just ask God, how come this is not happening in my life? And most of the time, in truth, we don't fully believe what we read in the first place. Because if we did, it would have happened and it would come to pass. You cannot half believe something, especially when it comes to God's word. Now, I hope I'm not confusing you, but I'm getting, getting to a point here. It is, it is so important that we get this. God, who is Spirit, meaning you cannot touch him, you cannot handle him, but yet he became embodied in Jesus. He became a living soul so that we could touch him, we could touch God. Because before that, people could not identify with God. God was religious in orientation for the Israelites, they wouldn't even mention his name. They could, they really wouldn't really be able to hear God the way Moses could hear him and talk with him. God wouldn't expose himself to the masses. 
Jesus Christ comes along and he gives us every expression of who the Father is. And that's why he said, everything that I'm saying, God is saying. God is always compassionate. God is always loving. Are you hearing me? He's always, I don't care what other people are saying, God is never mad at you. He's not that kind of person. He is not the kind of person like you and I. We get mad at you because you offended us. God can get angry, but he chooses to get angry. If God was an uncontrollable God and he, control, and, and he was controlled by his anger, then a lot of us would already be dead. In fact, all of us would be dead. We wouldn't even be in existence. Hang that up. Because we are too depraved in our nature. So in the beginning, God created, in, created all, God created everything in the beginning. And in the beginning, as God created, notice, go, can, I, can I take you back to Genesis? Genesis 1 and 1. I want you to see something. Because sometimes we read things and we don't know some things that are figurative are not literal also, but it has a dual understanding. Revelation comes in levels, meaning that's something that you can't get out of a textbook. God has to expose it to you. You remember when Jesus said to the disciples, who do men say that I am? Everybody was able to say, well, some say you're Elijah. Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're this, Isaiah. He said, but who do you say I am? Who do you say that I am? First it was, who do men say that I am? But who do you say that I am? And none of them can give an answer. Only Peter. And Peter didn't even know what he was saying. He says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, no one knows that. My father had to reveal that to you. Because no one had a clue. That is also to tell us that the same chapter in which he said that thou art the Christ and that God gave him that revelation is the same chapter he had to deal with his own insecurities and fear when he lied to Jesus and said, I'll never deny you. So in the midst of getting revelation from God, you can be just as devilish and evil. Say yes. yes. You are a combination of good and bad. That's your nature. Your good is only when you are born again. That's the only, you cannot be good in and of yourself. Naturally so. But catch Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's everything. Remember, in the beginning, it's, a, it's an emphatic statement. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Most of the time, and I got a revelation of this. Remember, revelation is also in tears. I got a revelation of this. I started thinking, God, wait a minute. You're dealing with us and, 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 and he says, oh, the first time you got it, he said it was true the first time but I'm going to give you something deeper. I said, okay, what is it? He said, everything was created when I created the heavens and the earth. The waters was created. That's why you see the waters. The darkness was created. That's why you see the darkness. He says, the spirit of God brewed or hovered over the face of the waters. God created things all things such as the earth and the heavens with water, space, and all the emptiness that we know and we identify as space. And he says, he's also in that created time and darkness. Light came the first day. Notice. It says in the third verse, then God said, let there be light and there was light. Now please get me on this. This is what we have to understand. God was saying, light didn't all of a sudden show up as if it didn't, 
wasn't created. It was created when I created the heavens and the earth. I'm revealing the sequence. Are you catching me? In other words, light your turn, come out. Light and there was. That means it already existed and it was. Light came out. You see, many of you don't know what's in you until God calls it out of you. There's so much more in you, but sometimes it's covered up by the debris of the hurt and the things that you experienced from your childhood growing up to the present moment. And it covered it up. And it's not that it's not there. It's just covered up. All of what you are is covered until you allow God to speak a word to bring it out of you. You can be everything that God designed you to be. But you can't be it until he calls it out of you. You see, you're not learning something for the first time. He's causing you to experience what you've already known. Amen. Again, Dr. Nelson brought the revelation out. When did, does a baby have teeth when it is born? You see, we all said no at first. A baby cannot not produce teeth until it, unless it has teeth. The teeth are just hidden. How much is in you? I'm going to tell you this. There's a treasure in you. The Bible says the treasure hidden in this earthen vessel. There's so much hidden in you, but you haven't got, received the word to get it out of you yet. So when God says, light be, light was, light came forth as if it already existed, not from. Are you hearing me? God created the heavens and the earth and then called each item out of its out of his places. Everything started with God. And the Bible says, catch this, the fourth verse, catch it please. It says, and God saw the light that it was good. And God divided, oh you got to pay attention to this. God divided the light from the darkness. Was darkness in existence? Yes, because he says, and darkness and void. Right? At the beginning. So God divided light from the darkness. In other words, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning was the first day. We don't get it. We're not getting the revelation. The revelation is you are a combination of light and darkness. At the very beginning. What do you mean? The Bible says when Job was complaining to God, catch this. When Job was complaining to God about why certain things and why God decided to do certain things, look at Job 38 and 19 and see what God said. He said to Job, where is the way to the dwelling of light? Since you, you want to complain to me about I should be this way and I should do this, he is saying, obviously you must know something. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? And darkness, where is its place? When it's gone, where does darkness go to? Notice the 20th verse. He says that you may follow it, it, to, follow it to its territory. In other words, that his, his dwelling place. That you may know the path to his home. Do you know where darkness lives? Come on, surely you got to know. Where does darkness live? Because if it keeps showing up, it's got to be somewhere. <laughs> Y'all get it? Can I ask you this? Can you do some pretty evil stuff? Where does it exist when you're doing good? It's hiding somewhere in you, isn't it? Oh. 
Somebody ought to be saying, God, help me, Jesus. Don't pray this stuff out of me. You see, darkness had to exist in the beginning or else man would have had no free will to choose light from darkness. It had to be. I'm going to give you more understanding on, on Wednesday. When the angels have the potential, even the angels have potentials, the potential of darkness and, and light because you can consider Lucifer who failed. God created human beings and angelic beings with the potential for life and death. And I'm going to explain that to you, not today. This is going to give you a better way of understanding how to be victorious in the word. Amen. How many of you are wrestling and have wrestled, wrestled with sin? Say yes, because all of us should have said yes automatically. Yes! How many of you have done wrong when you wanted to do right? Yes. Thank you. There's a reason why. Mm. And I'm telling you, man, when you get turned on to the truth and you start saying, man, God, why am I struggling with this? And where is it hiding that if you delivered me from it? Catch this. I, Isaiah said something that was powerful. He said, Isaiah 9 and 2. It says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Now, again, I got to take you back to Job. Because Job is like us. We, when we're going through something, we complain to God. And we act like, God, you should have done this. And God, you should have handled it this way. And God, if you really is God, our God, you should have done it this way. You should have intervened this. And you don't know this if you had done this. And, and God is like, oh. Mm. Notice Job 38 and 17. He's dealing with Job now because Job is complaining about going through. He says, have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Come on, surely y'all have. Because, I mean, you talk to God like you know everything. And like you think God should know what he should do. Based on what you think. This is just how I feel. God should have just did this. If he could do this, why didn't he do it? If he can stop everybody from starving in the world, why don't he feed everybody? God should have stopped my spouse from cheating on me. Some of you don't even know that there is a divine purpose in your weakness. You don't even know it. You think that sometimes because God doesn't come, he doesn't care. No, God doesn't come because if he came, you'll never learn how to depend on him and trust him. God is far more intelligent than you and I. All right? And, and, and you can say, well, God, I feel like I'm at the shadow of death. You don't even know where the door is based on the scripture. Come on, people. God, I'm dying up here. You know, uh, uh, shut up. Do you know where the gates of death is? Yeah, I've been to the gates of death. <laughs> you see, this, this could perhaps explain or give an explanation to why the tree of life was placed in the garden. It was intended for Jesus to be the light of men, not knowledge. You understand me now a little bit? He placed a tree, two trees in the garden. Now, there are a lot of trees in the garden now. We know that. He placed all the trees in the garden, fruit trees. And, and, and I dealt with these trees. Before I go to the verse, I want you to see this. First, let me talk and explain this. 
why would God put a tree of life in the midst and then put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Knowledge is considered light. Intellectually, you are ruled by that knowledge, which is not the knowledge of God. It's your own intellect and your own reasoning. Knowledge, we often say, gives you life. Knowledge opens doors for you. But you don't know what kind of doors the wrong knowledge opens up for you. The Bible says in Genesis 2 and 16, starting there, catch it. It says, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree in the garden, you may freely eat. Every tree, right? Say every tree. But he specifically says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day you shall, that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So he says you can eat of every tree. Now why does God, now notice we're dealing with man, you and I, we're man. And we're dealing with our issues. Even in the garden, we don't know we have issues. You're not created as God. And, and, and remember that. Part of you is dust. There's a reason because dust deals with frailty, weakness. Meaning dust has a need. Dust needs to eat from everything dust created or produces rather because it sustains dust. The food you ate this morning, if you ate, is dirt. Amen. All your fruit, fruits, vegetables, bread, all of it is dust, dirt. Because all you are physically is dirt. You're sustained by dirt. You can eat dirt and not die. Because that's what you are. Look at your neighbor and say, you are what you eat. You say, I don't eat no dirt. Oh, yes, you do. Every day you eat dirt. Amen. Amen. Where does the fruit come from? You see, you think the trees are just here. The trees is the combination of the dust that you and I are made out of. So God created the physical body from the dust to be sustained by everything that comes from it. Everything. Even a serpent, we can eat it. Yes, we get hungry for dirt all the time. And yet we get this prideful attitude. So how dare them think that I eat dirt? I, I don't care how you fix it up on the plate, it's still dirt. It just looks like some wonderful dirt. It may be fried dirt, broiled dirt, boiled dirt. <laughs> baked dirt, barbecued dirt, but it's all dirt because your body needs that dirt to sustain itself. The Bible says when you die, your body goes where? Back to the dust from which it came. But your spirit man goes to God from which it comes. Now, now listen. So he places the tree of knowledge because knowledge is what the enemy deceived Eve with. Everybody wants knowledge. The more you think you know, the more you think you're better off. You think your knowledge is greater than God's knowledge. That's why you don't pray to him until you feel like you can't handle it. 
And even when he starts to help you, you take over. And that's why your situation doesn't get better. It gets worse. Look at your name and say, hey, dirty person. So every time you get in the shower, you're just cleaning up that dirt. How much you can put on all kinds of deodorant. Let that stuff just, just work out. In fact, you don't have to work out. Just go to bed, go to sleep, and watch your... You don't even know when you get out of that bed how much dust you leave in the bed. Can I, can I say this to you? When you have those little, those little things in the bed on your mattress and, and stuff, where do you think they come from? The dust off your body gives life to those little things. You can't see them with your eye, but they're biting on you all at night. Because the same dust you are, they need that dust to survive. You little filthy person. You ever hear that phrase? You hear that phrase because it's a reality. You little dirty son of a dog, you. You filthy little. Because that's what you are. You're a filthy person. God cleans a filth. <laughs> Now, he doesn't use Tide and bleach and Clorox and OxyClean, which I really like because OxyClean works better than all that other stuff. He uses the washing of the water by the word. How do we kill off the deeds of the flesh? We mortify them through the Spirit, using the Word. Now, please, let me get back to the garden now. Okay. God never told Adam, don't touch the tree of life. He told him, don't touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But again, but he never told him to go to the tree of life either. Not specifically. But he did tell him to go to the tree of life. When did he tell him? When he told him. You can eat of every tree in the garden. It was Eve's desire for knowledge. The Bible says when she looked at the fruit and saw that it was pleasing to the eye and good for knowledge. I want knowledge. Why do you want knowledge? I want to be like God. I want to be God. Because God knows everything. Idiot, did you not know a fruit can't give you that? <laughs> if I eat this, if I read these books, if I get into this, I'll have all the knowledge that God has. I'll be smarter than God. Darwin had to read books to get his theory. And his theory still remains a theory to this day. An unproven, unproven truth. And it's not the truth. Huh. So the scripture says this, 2 Corinthians 4 and 6. I, 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 I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting somewhere with this. I, I'm getting you to get understand this. 4 and 6, 2 Corinthians 4 and 6. For it is God who commanded light to shine where? Say it again. Say it again. Not from darkness, but out of darkness. When God said, let there be light, what was already there? Darkness, wasn't it? Yes. Darkness was there. And God said, I want you to shine out of it. Not that you're coming from it. You're coming out of it. Who has shone in his hearts to, to give the light of the knowledge 
of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the knowledge that God wants to give us. This is why the tree was placed in the middle of the garden. Because it was, life was not to be given to you by light of knowledge, but light of the word. And whenever you get light of your knowledge, it's, it's almost like someone feeling as if you and I know that they've never gone to school for anything, but they can tell me about how to deal with my body. I say, I got a headache. Why don't you do this? Put some pressure on this right here. And then, uh, uh, you know, don't, you don't have to take any medication because you can naturally heal yourself. And you can do it this way. You've never gone to any school You've got information passed to you, and it's always that way. We are always hearing passed on erroneous information passed on to us that gives us a false sense of hope because we think we have now knowledge. Knowledge always makes you feel like you're better than somebody. Always. You want to know the truth of the matter is, when people say, that person is condescending. They're not condescending. And we say, but they really have a good heart. No, they don't have a good heart. The reason why they're condescending is because they don't have a good heart. Because you're, you can only be condescending to somebody you think you're better than. I don't care how smart Alec they sound. I don't care how they can sound as if you are the, the, the greatest idiot on this planet. Most of us can have that thought without realizing that our knowledge base has made us feel like that we're no more than others, and that's why people don't listen to God's word. If you believe God's word, you will believe his word over the coronavirus. We will say, oh, I, I trust God, but until they say the professionals... The experts say, it's safe to come outside. Yes. Then we'll say, okay, it's safe to come outside. We got to use wisdom now. Idiot, that's not the wisdom of God. That's the wisdom and the sensuality of this world. That knowledge made you feel like you're better than everybody else, and it made you feel as if you could control, and control people to a large extent. They do. They control you through the instead of you being controlled by the word. You indenture yourself to the word, but not the world. They'll control you. When you look at politics, it's all a control factor. When you look at the news, everything is about scaring you into making a decision and believing something. You are the greatest evangelist of ignorance this world has ever known. Yeah, you spread the word. You spread lies all the time. And you're an instigator, troublemaker, always stirring up stuff. You don't know that you're doing it because you think it's natural. How many of you have degrees? I have my thermometer over there, so I'm up to 100 and something on degrees. So, you, no, 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 no. But how many of you get, have degrees? Raise your hand. Okay, you have degrees. How many of you know that, how many of you felt better? Be honest, when you got a degree and it made you feel as if, I got a bachelor's or I got a BS. I got to be careful which BS you got. <laughs> Then I have a master's. Then I have a PhD. Then I have this. And then we'll say things like, now, 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 I understand what you're saying, but, but really the truth of the matter is, I mean, because I've studied this, and I know I have the books, I've read this, and I've, I've read this particular theory, I've read Pope this, and I've read this, this Gregory this, and I've gone over all the, the books of the Greek and the Hebrew, and, 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 and that still doesn't give you the kind of knowledge that God has. 
But you can believe it does. And you can believe it so strongly that you're idiotic, idiotic when it comes to talking to people. You know how many people that when I first came into Christianity, this is the honest to God truth. People said, you know, black people are cursed with black skin. Because the Bible says in Genesis, people, that is one of the biggest lies that people still believe to this day. They've never read it. That's why they believe it. Because if you read it, you'll find out it doesn't say that. Doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't even say that Adam was perfect. He was just created without sin first. If he was perfect, he would not need the tree of life. So he wasn't created to live forever because he can't be God. He cannot be eternal. Not in that sense, not in the physical. Are you, he was created to be mortal. That's why he needed the tree. But every potential of, pers of a person with mortal that's mortal, have to fight between that which is in him spirit and that which is without physical. And the things that gravitates you to things physically cannot be overcome by the things on the outside. It has to be overcome by what's on the inside. You were intended, every woman in here, every man, you were intended to live life from the inside out, not from the outside. When you live life from the outside, you're regulated and mastered by your insatiable appetites that this flesh needs. Especially after the fall. It needs sin. That's why the body cannot be saved. Never under any circumstances. You are not to give any glory. In fact, the Bible says we're not to have any confidence in the flesh. Can I help you with this? How did I overcome not cheating? Y'all like to hear the truth, right? I never cheated on my wife, okay? But it doesn't mean the, the potential isn't there. I have not made it until I get to the end of this thing, right? So I'm not, I'm not perfect. I'm growing into maturity. So every day I have to be challenged. I'm challenged with what is on the outside that's gravitating, this, this gravitational pull from sin in the earth. Everything pulls me just like it pulls you. If, if it even pulls me in the natural things, it's natural for me to eat. It's just not, it's not natural to overeat. Right? You can have a plate and you're full with half the food gone. But there is something in you that says, eat all your food. <laughs> and you can hear mama saying, eat all your vegetables, eat all that food. All, don't get up from this table until you eat all that food. You are just about at the point of throwing up <laughs> if you eat another bite. And then you develop that appetite to eat and eat and eat. And then conditions starts to stimulate that appetite. You're depressed, so you start eating. Yes. You, everything starts feeding into what you need on the outside to survive. God created your physical man for sexual desires. Did you know that? I said, did you all know that? Yes. Hello? We are in the Bible. <laughs> okay. 
He created that for that purpose. So for procreation. That was the main part. The second part is you cannot procreate always. So procreation then has to turn into recreation. That's what I should be, everybody should be like, yeah. Yeah, okay, anyway. <laughs> I just want you to know and realize some things. How did I overcome what I knew that in myself, I did not have the, uh, the power to overcome, to realize that the authority to overcome all of those insatiable, uncontrollable appetites. Have you ever got mad and not cursed? Now, for me, I have. I've gotten mad and not cursed. How did I overcome? How did I get to that place? I realized I couldn't do it in and of myself. My knowledge base was inferior to the light of God's knowledge in me. So I depend more on the knowledge of God in me. And beloved, believe me, I got into some situations. I mean, I could have said MFs. I mean, all of it. I was a professional cusser. No, cusser. Being brought up, we, I, we, I've been cussing ever since, you know, I was cussing from a baby, man. I came out of the crib, give me that, give me that dog on my, my, my so, 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 my bottle. <laughs> I was a cusser, man. My whole family cussed. It was a norm. When I got born again, it was one thing the, pe the old ladies told me. They said, son, tell God you can't stop cussing on your own. You can't stop drinking on your own. You can't stop chasing women on your own. Ask them to help you because you can't do it. I really, I knew I couldn't do it, Ricky. I knew it. You see, some of you still face your own knowledge and thinking, oh, yes, I can handle it. I, 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 oh, yeah, oh, I, I can take it from here. I, I don't, you can't. It's impossible. So I believe what those old ladies said. Right. Now they may not have had a lot of the, the Greek and Hebrew and understanding certain things, but they, they had common, simple sense. When you can't do something, depend on someone who can to help you. And I never, ever, from that day forward, cussed another word. Not intentionally, I may have used something as, a, as an example to someone, but never intentionally. I never accidentally cussed. The words were replaced with praise God. I stomped my toe. Oh, praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Who? It's, it's almost like where did it come from? The moment I released my knowledge and did not make it superior to God's knowledge. Yes. The Bible says, casting down every thought, thoughts or words, right? And every imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's how I overcome all the time. It's not that I'm better than anyone or I'm greater and more powerful. I just realize I can't do it. And if you've been here any amount of time, I told you I'm weak. If it wasn't for God, I would be chasing everything in a skirt with two legs. See, y'all don't like hearing the truth. The Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. That's how I overcome. I don't go around, and remember, I've shared on this on, on, so many times. I don't go around and let my mind wander off and start thinking of having an emotional affair with someone at the water fountain. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. When somebody says, oh, Michael, you smell so nice today. I don't say, oh, man, my wife, she doesn't even acknowledge 
what I smell like. Thank you very much, baby. What's your name? What your name is? <laughs> I don't play with it because, again, remember, I know what I'm capable of doing without God. I make a decision every day of my life, practically every moment, don't surrender to this. Give it to God. Don't start believing this. Give it to God. When it deals with, I don't care if it's financial, if it's sickness or whatever, give it to, give it to God. By his stripes, you were healed. Give it to God. So a lot of us haven't come to the conclusion, have not come to the conclusion that your knowledge isn't superior to God. That's why you still wrestle with certain things. You know why you can't forgive somebody? Because you don't want to. You don't want to. You want to hold them hostage. It doesn't, you see, here's a, again, this is another thing. See, I don't have an issue. Okay, you did certain things. Okay, you, I, don't, I don't trust you. Okay, all of these things happened. Listen to me. You stole money. All right, from, okay, all right. You asked for forgiveness. All right, praise God, we move on. If it's money you stole, I ain't giving you nothing else. Right? Why do I? That, that doesn't mean I don't forgive you. Are y'all listening to me? If, if my children stole something from my bedroom and I decide to lock my door, it doesn't mean I didn't forgive them. I just don't want to tempt them. Lead us not. That, isn't that a prayer? It's, it's not right of you to know that you got a brother who is not born again and he looks at your daughter with goo goo eyes because he's got issues. And you expose your daughter to him thinking that's just your brother and he'll never do anything. Let me tell you something. Don't, I've been around too long talked with too many people, prayed with too many people who have experienced parents that could have intervened, but because they trusted another adult and not trusted the instinct that God placed in them, hey, be careful. Don't let your daughter be around this person. Don't let your son be around this person. And you expose them. And now they got to deal with stuff growing up of anger against the person that molested them and the parents that let them do it because they trusted the person. I'm getting upset. That dabble. <laughs> I'm not even done. But I'll finish up on Wednesday. But I got to give you this. The problem in the garden was that you wanted superior knowledge to God's knowledge. It's always that way, people. Whenever there's an issue between people, it's always someone knows, thinks they know more than the other person. And you know that. Democrats think they know more than the Republicans. The Republicans think they know more than the Democrats. And they both know that they, they know in their minds and in their hearts that they know more than the independents. Independent. <laughs> Everybody is in comparison with how much knowledge they have. You know why you can have problems in, in, in the praise and worship group or the choir? Because you got some joker that think they can sing better than everybody else. 
and they think they know more than anyone else. But the truth of the matter is, the person that is not the greatest singer is usually the best praise and worship leader. They just want to give God glory. How do you do, how do you have an argument in practice singing unto the Lord and then arguing about uh, how come I'm not leading songs? That is the reason why you're not leading songs. Because if you got to try to wonder why you're not leading songs, isn't that an indication that you want something so bad that you're ready to ridicule everybody else in the process to, to try to position yourself as someone better than someone else. That's why I, I don't like all this riff and stuff. And, and praise and worship, please, don't give me all this. And jeez, you're getting all the glory. I don't want to hear it. I want to just praise God. Can we just have a great time in worshiping our God without being in comparison? And whatever is in you, deny that desire to want to be acknowledged by people. That only, become, that only comes because you want someone to acknowledge your knowledge base and your thoughts about yourself and your ability. Hello. I don't need you to pat me on the back. I don't need you to say, good sermon, good it's not a sermon. It's a message God has given to every single one of us. Are you hearing me? Beloved, this life is real if you haven't realized this and these issues and problems are real. People are really dealing with alcoholism, drugs, pornography, molestation, pedophiles. It is, these are real issues, molestation. Real issues that have touched almost everybody in this church, I guarantee you. Real issues. And we can't deal with uh, the rest of our lives on petty stuff. We just can't do that. I, I just refuse that my marriage will be full of pettiness. I, I can't deal with it that way. You're saved, I'm saved. We're supposed to depend on God. Let God be the referee. It's when you don't want God to be the referee because you don't want to hear what God has to say. The Bible says, acknowledge me in all your ways, God said, and I'll direct your path. But we're like, no, you're the last one I want to acknowledge because I'm too angry, God, and I want that man to feel my wrath. It's like, God, I'm going to put my religion aside over here and I'm going to give this person a piece of my mind. Then I'll come back and pick it up and I'll come and praise you. Man, you know more great, what is greater and worse than you not knowing the personal things and acknowledging things you're dealing with? is when you don't know the consequences of the lack of depending on that word that you go to hell for the rest of your eternity. Eternity. You're, you're literally bartering five minutes of sexual desires. If it's that, outside of your marriage, for eternity in hell. And you're not going to last five minutes anyway. That's why the song says it only takes a minute. <laughs> I don't care what guy's telling you women all night long. Hang. So here's the issue. What are images? Dear, stand up. Can I use you as an example? Is that an image? Does it have a name? Yeah. That image 
uh, as young as she is, doesn't have just one name. She's had other things attached to her that you can find jokers in church that sees lust, appetites, sexual appetites, as innocent as she could be, which could possibly be the case. Yet I guarantee you she's dealing with things. And it's all identified with words. Identify and acknowledge what you personally have an issue with and call it out. You can sit down. Thank you, dear. And call it out by name. When you look in the mirror and you have a low self-esteem, say to yourself what you're really thinking. I'm ugly. Change that because that's a lie. Because what is ugly in God's word? There is no such thing as ugly in the word of God. Because the Bible says God has made all things beautiful in his. So the way we start off is not how we're going to end up. I can tell you another thing that will help you. Stop putting all the emphasis on your outer body. Stop thinking that you're getting dressed for somebody else to like you. Can I ask you to do this? Because that'll help you. you, you it really would help you if you, you know, oh, oh I got to make sure, you know, oh, put my eyebrows, they're like as thick as a, a mountaintop, you know. <laughs> you know, you know, man, they're like, and my eyelash, oh, ooh, put them out there like out here, man. And, and you done put all kinds of collagen in your lips and shot it up with Botox and then you put your nose and you made your nose like this and you can't even breathe. And you all of a sudden got this long, super luxurious hairdo and it shakes real slow when you shake it. And you go outside, they're going to love me. And they don't. Because they see a fake. There's a song that we used to say. She's a fake. Come on. Uh. <laughs> I don't know that song. Okay. <laughs> I was almost there, babe. Don't have to do it. <laughs> She's a fake. Okay. All my life, I was that guy that could not walk past a mirror without looking. First of all, I had beautiful hair, contrary to popular belief. From the time I was a kid, man, I had my afro out. We had the blowout kit in those days. Anybody, y'all remember the blowout kit? The blowout kit was necessary because your hair was so nappy. <laughs> It had to be blew out. No. But it was subject to return based on humidity. <laughs> this is the truth. My hair is like this. I'm at a club. <laughs> I, 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 I pulled, the, we call it pull. I was able to engage in this I was only 17, I was only to en I was able to engage in this 22 year old woman. And man, I was the man, I was like, oh God. <laughs> and we we're at this party, man. And my brother was like, oh man, you got it. I was like, oh yeah. Then he said, hey Mike. I said, what? Cause it was hot in that place. He said, your hair is gone. I said, what, what you mean? He said, it went down. I said, oh my God. <laughs> I left the party. This is the oddest country. I left the party, ran home, got out there, put my blowout kit back on. <laughs> Honest to God, truth. And until I got delivered, I had that issue well into my adult years. And you know what? My unfaithfulness was tied to it. how I wanted to look, 
have the best shoes, the best clothes. I mean, I believe in dressing nice, but it's not what makes me. Amen. Amen. My wife, thank you, baby. I, I t- this, see, I, see, I said, man, if everybody can experience what I've experienced by surrendering, and that's every day, how often do we die? Daily. How often do we die? Daily. Every day, you got to ask God to resurrect you. You should die every day to your own feelings and desires, or it's going to come up every day and steer you in the wrong direction, and it'll make you be what you're not designed to be. So I, 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 I have this wonderful relationship with God and with my spouse. No hiding. No, when I say no, no hiding. I'm not secretly trying to get a date with anybody. I believe that if God, if I screwed up, you will know it. God will expose me openly. And I want him to. I'd rather lose all of this instead of losing my soul playing around with God. Amen. Amen. So don't tell me that, hey, you don't know what it's like. I know what it's like to smoke a blunt. Not just a blunt, but angel dust. Now, I got some law enforcement people. Now, I'm saved, brother. I know you're law enforcement. I'm not saved. I'm not bringing anything across the border. I used to bring things across here, but but not anymore, praise God. But I, I, I love God. I love him with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul and my strength. And I ask God, God, help me to stay that way every day. And I ask him every morning. Even this morning, I, 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 I'm praying. And, and I must have almost forgotten. And the Holy Spirit said, do you want me to keep you today? I said, oh, yes. Lord, keep me today. Keep me from stumbling. Keep me from falling. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. I made that decision. And so I get up, and I'm not concerned about not falling. I'm concerned about how I live for his glory and his honor. Amen. You want to be victorious? Start with the word. In the beginning, God was the word. If the word created everything, you have the ability to speak the words to change everything. You want to change the way you feel about something? Read the word and start regurgitating it. Speak it. You want to be an overcomer? Speak the word. Greater is he who is in me than the devil that's in the world. And believe it. Don't just say it. Believe it. Believe it and believe that God can and he will change your life circumstances and you do not have to live in the darkness anymore because the light of his glory will shine out of the darkness. Give the Lord a praise offering. He's worthy. Now as simple to me as that is, We make it hard, but it's simple. And I'm asking you to let God minister to your heart. Stop playing with God and stop thinking you can't do something when he's given you the ability to do it when he's your strength. You don't have to sin. I said you don't have to sin. Say I don't have to sin. Say it again, say it again. Now say it like you mean it. Say, I don't have to hold the grudge against my spouse. I don't have to hold a grudge against my brother or my sister. I'm free. So when you don't have anything between, when we have something between us, you know what it keeps us from doing? 
getting close to each other. When something is in between us, it's unspoken. You all know what it is. You know what it could be, but it keeps you from getting close. And when, if you can come, baby, if you could, when you're not, when you're not, when you got something in between you, even your own spouse, you, <laughs> you know, your head goes out, body language, you look like you want to come together, but you're not free. Look, you see how that is? She's pushing me off. But when you're free, you're not like this. This your spouse. But you're like this. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Yes. Thank you, dear. Remember, she's just a person to you. She's my wife to me. And she's who God has allowed to be in my life. And I will not abuse her in Jesus' name. And it's not subject to her abusing me, right? If she does, I'm, I'm big enough by God's strength she can't stop me from being what I'm supposed to be. So if she decides to hold a little bit of anger against me and don't want to cook, and she wants to give me, she wants to treat me like a Greek god and give me burnt offerings. <laughs> I just say, that's okay, babe. Would you like to go out to get something to eat? She'll say, yeah. Let's go. And we will not be in a restaurant, both of us on our phone. That's not going to happen. I'm telling you, my, uh, 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 we're not going to be like, mm, yeah, ordering. Yeah, I'm waiting on my order. Thank you. And, and she and I are not communicating. It's no, I'm not flying like that. That's, this is my life. This is, this is for the rest of my human life as long as we are alive. She is my body and I'm her body. She has, she is subject to give me whatever I want from that body. A headache don't affect anything. Jesus said the bed is undefiled. Put on that gown, baby. I got some communication to get on. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> get the Lord of praise off him one more time. Bless God. <laughs> Are you ready to give? Come on, whatever God has laid on your heart, you know the importance of giving. Those who are watching, please hear this word. If you're going to believe the report of the Lord, believe the report of the Lord and come to church. You can't believe the report of the Lord and then do just the opposite. And I'm, if you trust me as your pastor, and I say by the grace of God, you come, even if you come in your own doubt and fear, you will not get coronavirus here. But when you leave, you may get it. But as long as you're here under this covering, you won't get it. I believe in the man of God. Whatever God said. Are you listening to me? I love you all. I appreciate what God is doing. Did you get something out of this word, sister? Yes, you did. Our little Kalia, she was just a little bitty girl growing up, coming all the way from North Carolina or something. Savannah, Georgia, I'm sorry. And you can hear it in her accent. She's as country. Just like her mama. <laughs> but God is a good God. Did you get this word? Okay, all right. You got your, your offering, your seed ready? Are you great givers? 
Now, those who are watching by way of internet, you know what to do. This is not a part for you to not participate. It is the whole thing. Let your seed represent your attitude of gratitude. Be honest with God. Be faithful. Trust God. Sow your seed. Give him your tithes and offerings. Do what is right and what is pleasing in God's sight. Amen. Stand to your feet. Bless the Lord. Whew. I, do y'all want to hear the rest of this thing on, on Wednesday? Because we're going to deal with that garden now. It's going to be a little bit deep. But we want to go deep. The deep call into the deep. But it's simple. The simple things are easy to understand. So we just want to give God uh, the realities of what he's blessed us with. He's a good God. Glory to God. Now, are you ready to give? Now, why do we put things in our, the gift in our right hand? Because we don't want to give God what's left. We give God what is right, not what's left. God is not a God that you, you treat as if he handles all your leftovers. He's first. And if you trust him, he'll prosper you even more than what you can produce on your own. And so, Father, we hold our seed up in our right hand. We give you what's right and not what's left. We trust in your word. And we're sowing for your kingdom, for the expansion of your work in the earth. Now, God, as much as I'm sharing this, God, the world is looking at their lives, and they have to be examples to the world. Let them realize that you don't expect for them to depend on their strength, nor their knowledge. You'll give them both the knowledge and the strength if, if they'll just turn to you and depend on, on you for that. And you will strengthen them and prosper them and keep them even from the hour of temptation. You will cause them to be conquerors, more than conquerors, through Jesus Christ who loves them. And you will bless their seed and all of what they place their hands to, you will prosper them. And so, God, we thank you for the doors being opened for economic, economically, Father, for jobs, for promotion. You are faithful, and the favor of God is placed upon us. And let us begin to realize that favor that you have so placed upon us that you that you favored us in your eyes. So we honestly thank you, and we give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for our harvest. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Go ahead and put it in there and say thank you for our harvest. Woo. Angel. That's your name, right? Angel. Everybody give God a praise offering for Angel being with us and being whole. Glory to God. Every day, your pop pop would come when he would come, he would have us to pray. He would ask, ask and specifically come to me. Sometimes we don't realize someone loves us so much that when they can't do something and they know who can and they know, hey, I need somebody that knows how to get a prayer through. And every day, it didn't look good, did it, John, at first? Every, but Irma, you see what God did, right? You all see, the, that, that's the whole family right here, part of the family, glory to God. And, and that's how God moves on our behalf, when we see God do things, and he ministers to us through that. So remember, we're still praying for Josephina. She's, she's still in uh, San, San Antonio. You can tell her we miss her. Uh -uh. Praise God. We, 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 well, we miss her more than she misses us. And we love her. Glory to God. We thank God for what he's doing. Now, Elder Sparkman is going to uh, go back there, but he'll be there. And, uh, and Ricky, y'all know, can you take your wonderful, beautiful wife with you? Amen. She is your beautiful wife, right? Oh, yeah. That, that is your handsome husband, right? What, like, yeah, right, sure. Okay, yeah. Just come on, man. Just get, you notice how she's leading him. 
That's all right. No, no. Just <laughs> you walk side by side. Don't worry about who's leading who. She's, she's just as humble uh, in church. <laughs> when she gets home, all the true colors show out. Now, just stand there. Now, all our first-time visitors, we know we have one, uh, uh, our sister over here. Uh, uh, who else? Who else is a first? Glory to God, our sister over here. Who else? First time. Now, again, remember, some of you have been coming, and I have never had an opportunity of meeting you. And we had one young lady came in. Because I hadn't had the opportunity to meet her, but she said, I'm going over there. I want to encourage you, at the first time visitors, can you get with someone? Glory to God, thank you. Take them over to the cafeteria. We have refreshments. We'll give you information and a gift from the church. And we have some good, I don't know what if it's cake or sandwiches, but next week, we will eat after the service. So don't leave. We have a celebration. Of course, uh, everybody's coming in. Uh, uh, I'm looking at that right there. Glory to God. Everyone is coming in. We've got some people from North Carolina. I mean, uh, from uh, uh, out New Mexico. Uh, we would have uh, Phoenix online. Our Phoenix church will be online for the duration of the service. Uh, and so everybody's coming together and uh and doing a little celebration, a birthday celebration, which I appreciate, glory to God. But it's the fellowship that we're going to have afterwards that's just going to make this wonderful event powerful. Sister, Tanya, take your friend over there. Y'all just looking at me like, 